we want to have the largest sample size that we can, right? So that's those are some really good hallmark things with the, with the experimental design that you want to try to have. Okay, so we have uh, we have experiment, and then after we collect our data, and our data should be somewhat, it should be objective, so it should be numerical, so we have <coughs> some way that we can actually quantify what it is that we're seeing. What do we have to do next? And how do we do that? How do we do that? If we get all this, we get all this data, we want to know we're just going to be supported. How do we? How do we figure that out? Get right through statistics. Statistics will tell us a story. Is is it really different? Is what we saw in the experimental group really different from what we saw in the control group? And if yes, then we accept the hypothesis. If not, we reject it. If we accept the hypothesis, then does it become a theory? Not yet. Eventually, but that hypothesis has to be tested and it has to be retested and retested again. Then, through time, when it's tested in different ways, then it can become a theory. And then in time, a theory can become a law. Very good. Okay, so now, homeostasis. What is homeostasis by definition? Who can give me a good definition of that? Negative feedback loop. Okay, uh, negative feedback loops help to maintain homeostasis. Right. But homeostasis itself is what, by definition? It is a maintenance. Okay, good. Okay, so it's it's it's. It's maintenance and control of an internal environment. So the inside environment of your body, it, it's your, your physiology helps to maintain this, this constant, consistent internal environment despite the fact that the outside <coughs> world is changing around this body. And in that way, we stay stable. If we got too out of control, like for example, if somebody had fever, um, we, we'll learn today that that can actually be very detrimental because it can cause a lot of our proteins to break apart in ways that they, they can't come back together. And a lot of things that we have in our bodies are actually proteins and they help you know, to do a lot of things. So that could, could kill us. Likewise, if your blood pH becomes too acidic or too basic, right, and, and there's no homeostatic negative feedback loop to, con to control this, then it can cause effects and ultimately the organism, AKA us, to die. So homeostasis is the body's ability through physiology to maintain a relatively constant internal environment despite an ever-changing outside one. Okay, so mm -hmm. negative feedback loops. Um, what are the major components to the negative feedback loop? <coughs> Right, so you have your sensor, you have, which picks up the change, right, from our set point. We have our integrating center, which basically takes in that information, figures out what to do with it, right? Uh, or control center, you can say, integrating center, control center. And then we have an effector, which the control center is gonna communicate with to ultimately cause some kind of an effect. So give me an example of a negative feedback loop. I'm never gonna figure out my password for this. What? What's, what's an example? Oh, what did you say, Grayson? Oh, yeah, put a thermostat in your house. That's it. Oh, somehow I got it this time. I swear I, no I didn't. <laughs> I'm never going to get this password. We're never going to have class today. Uh, that's not it. Okay. So thermostat. So if we're giving if we're giving this example, um, what what would be our sensor? Okay, that would be our stimulus. The stimulus. So any deviation from the set point is our stimulus. So if we have our thermostat set to 67 degrees and the temperature drops to 66. That's our stimulus, it's our deviation from the set point. 
Okay, so we deviate from a set point. Our sensor detects this. What's our sensor in this example? The thermostat. The thermostat. That picks up the change. That sends a signal to the control center, which is also the well integrating center. But what is it in this example? <coughs> the, the, the thermostat still, right? And then that's going to figure out what to do with this signal. So we have our thermostat sends a signal to our effector, which is the what? The furnace. The furnace is our effector, which the effect is going to be that it turns on, and that's going to help to raise the temperature, which shuts off the initial stimulus, which makes it negative feedback. So there are other examples of that we talked about. We talked about blood sugar regulation. We talked about blood pressure regulation. And we said that 98%, pretty much almost all feedback loops that we have in the body are negative feedback loops because those are the, what controls homeostasis. But positive feedback loops, these are rare. We gave three examples of them. You don't see them very often. Positive feedback loops do what? <coughs> They do what? They amplify whatever is happening, right? So, you know, that's not going to help maintain homeostasis, but it will produce some type of an effect, which is, is going to be necessary. I need to do this very slowly because I know that that has to be my password. Every time this happens to me. See? There. See, I just had to do it slowly. I can't type. It's the same password I must have typed in 20 times. But watch, it'll do this and then it'll come up and be like, no, it's incorrect. After 20 minutes of trying to log in, that's what it does to me every time. All right, so anyhow, um, okay, so positive feedback loops. What are some examples of this? Blood clots. Uh, blood clots, you said, everybody, right. Pretty much everybody said that. Um, blood clots, right. So remember that platelets, Platelets will um, aggregate onto an area that's been damaged in the blood vessel, and that will stop the hemorrhaging. That's the whole point of, of, of that. So we, we cease bleeding. We have um, this, this plug that we're trying to produce. So the, the platelets go to the site, and then what that does is that causes those platelets that are adhering to this tissue to release chemicals, which are going to cause other platelets to come, which causes even more chemical release, which causes even more platelets to come, which causes even more chemical release, causes more platelets to come, until we get a plug produced, and then the feedback loop stops. So the point of positive feedback is really to produce some type of an effect by amplifying what's going on. So positive feedback loops, they don't maintain um, homeostasis, but they do produce something, some type of a thing happens with positive feedback loop. Okay. All right. So then uh, we ended up talking about tissues. We talked about, uh, well, what are the four major types of tissues, first of all? Muscle. Muscle. Nervous, you said. Skeletal. Epithelial. Cardiac. Well, skeletal and cardiac are types of muscle tissue, right? So we already covered that general Nervous category. tissue? Which one? Nervous tissue. Yeah, yeah, muscle, nervous, epithelial, and connective. Those are the, right, those are the four types of tissues. So we talked about muscle. Which type of tissue has intercalated discs, bless you? Cardiac muscle does, right? Uh, and, and at those intercalated discs, we have what kind of junction that allows for all the cells to rapidly communicate with each other at, at the same time? Did you say gap junctions? No. <laughs> I mean, did anybody say gap junctions? You did say? So gap junctions at intercalated discs, which again are these little pores, they allow the ions to flow rapidly from cell to cell to cell. Um, and in this way, cardiac muscle tissue, which also structurally is highly branched, it will all contract together. Every cell will contract in a unit, which is what you want. Because you think about the heart muscle, its job is to try to pump as much blood out of the body, body or I should say out of the heart, and into the, the rest of the body as possible. So you want every single muscle fiber to contract if you can. 
So, um, so cardiac muscle is branched, it's got shorter cells, intercalated discs with gap junctions at each one. Okay, um, how about skeletal muscle? Skeletal muscle is similar to cardiac muscle, how? <coughs> It is striated, yes it is, okay. And, but the difference is what? Are the cells short in skeletal muscle? Are they short cells? No, they're real long. They have usually more than one nucleus, right, out on the periphery of the cell, so on the edges. And the, the fibers, are they branched? How would you say they're arranged? Sorry. Yes, you're correct, but I'm incorrect. Apparently, my password's wrong again. I'm so passwordly challenged, it's not even funny. You're right, they are arranged in parallel, which allows us to be able to utilize, you know, some skeletal muscle fibers when we need to, and maybe allow the others to relax. So in other words, this allows us to recruit the number of fibers we need to generate the amount of power we need for a particular task. So that's where you know structure and function comes into play when it comes to skeletal versus cardiac muscle tissue. And then smooth muscle tissue, it does have actin and myosin, but it's not arranged in that sarcomere to give that striated appearance. So um, smooth muscle, where do you find it usually? Digestive system, you said? That's right. So the digestive system would be a place, sure. And really any kind of organ that has a lumen um, that's circular. So blood vessels, the bronchioles in the, um, you know, the, the, the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, uh, ureters actually have smooth muscle because in the ureters there is a little bit of peristaltic movement that can help to move urine from the renal pelvis into the bladder. And that's why whenever you're sleeping at night and you're laying horizontally, you can still produce urine and still make your bladder full because of the smooth muscle there. Um, any kind of sphincter that is um, involuntary, so for example, the internal urethral sphincter, if you remember, that was involuntary, that's smooth muscle. Um, so smooth muscle is not controlled through the voluntary nervous system like skeletal muscle. It is controlled autonomically. All right, so that's muscle. Nervous, what's the pathway of conduction? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. What are the two types of cells that make up nervous tissue? The glial cells, good, and then the neuron, right. And which one's more abundant? Not the neuron. the neuron. The neuron does transmit the signals, but it is supported by the glial cells. And the glial cells, like they say, it takes a village to raise a child, right? So like the child has all this potential to do something, but you need all of these individual inputs to help. So there's a lot more people to help raise that child. It's just like that with glial cells. Glial cells are five times more abundant than what neurons are. Now, in neurons, what is the direction, what are, what are the three major parts, I'll ask that, what are the three major parts of the neuron? Right, the dendrites, the cell body, and the axon, what's the direction of signal conduction, if you had to go through those structures? Right. The dendrites, the dendrites collects information from other cells, goes to the cell body, from the cell body, it goes out to the axon, and then the axon will send a signal to an effector, which is usually a muscle or a gland. And it can be a skeletal muscle, it could be smooth muscle, it could be cardiac muscle, or it could be a gland, like for example, the pancreas, which does have a glandular function, or the thyroid, or the posterior pituitary in the brain, any of those, right? Okay, so that's muscle and nervous tissue, and then we talked about epithelial tissues, and we also talked about it in lab uh, for a little extra. What are the three shapes of epithelial cells that we can see? <coughs> Squid. 
Yep. Weymus, what else? Columnar and cuboidal, I heard both. Um, very good. <sighs> you know, I have to peck at this. I've got to stop talking for a minute and I have to peck at this. See, I swear I can't type and talk at the same time. That is my primary problem. Okay, so uh, we have squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. Now, which one is most adapted for filtration? If you had to pick a shape of those, squamous, squamous because they're they're thin, but they have to be arranged in what kind of a layer? Simple because it's a thin layer. Remember, any simple epithelium is always going to be adapted for transport, whether it be absorption, reabsorption, filtration, secretion, any of that stuff, right? If What's the other type of uh, layered arrangement that we have that we talked about? Stratified. Right, stra stratified. Now, stratified is best... Okay, fine, it's out of date, but let, let me log in still. So now my second factor authentication doesn't work. I, we may have to take a break while I handle the technical issues of today, but at least we can finish reviewing what we covered on um, Tuesday or Thursday last week. All right. So so anyway, so we have uh, the you said the the stratified layers are adapted for protection. That's good. And what. We didn't get into this yet, but we do have uh, one type of epithelium is stratified. Do you remember which one it was? This is not going to be from lecture. This is going to probably be from your previous knowledge. Which one? No, I didn't know. Not pseudo stratified, but there's one type of epithelium that is stratified. You actually find it on the surface of your skin, so the upper layer of your skin. Do you remember what it was? Right, stratified squamous. And today we're going to be picking up talking a little bit about keratin versus non-keratinized, which we did talk about in lab, but for those of you not in lab, we're going to review that in here today. So um, I think we need to take about 10 minutes. Unfortunately, it's a little early, but I've got to figure out how to get this um, second factor to work. I think they updated the system, and now it's a little bit different. I might have to call IT. So anyway, take uh, 10 minutes, uh, come back about 9.45, and we'll resume and pick up with the new stuff for today. Talk a little bit about chemistry after we get through chapter one.